I truly believe that we are losing our sense of self-awareness because we don't spend any time thinking about the things that are happening to us unless there is some kind of tragedy or, or horrible circumstance that forces us to stop. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 274. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. This week, our featured guest is Ryder Carroll. He's a digital product designer and inventor of the Bullet Journal. He's the author of the new book, The Bullet Journal Method. Ryder has been featured by the New York Times, Fast Company, Life Hacker, and Mashable, and gave a TEDx talk on keeping a journal to declutter your mind. So this episode is very timely as it is the new year. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Wishing you the best 2019 ever. Yeah, we're super excited to have Ryder on for our New Year's Day episode because at the beginning of the year, a lot of people are thinking about how to start organizing their life and their minds. And a lot of people may want to take up journaling and find a form that works for them. And bullet journaling has been around for a long time, and it suits so many different people. And Jesse, in fact, has really taken to it. It's a form of journaling that really resonates with him and his personality. I love it too, but I have a form of journaling that I've been doing for a long time. So it doesn't suit me as well as it suits Jesse, but what I have taken away is so many different strategies and tips from the bullet journal method into my current journal. And I'm so excited for you guys to learn so much about this. And it's going to be such a great way to get your 2019 organized. So here is some of what we talk about. We talk about how writer's ADD eventually led to the creation of the bullet journal what bullet journaling actually is, the benefits of using pen and paper versus an app, using journaling as a tool to connect with yourself, not falling into the perfectionism trap, how organization can become its own form of distraction. And you'll learn so much about that. We are so excited for you guys to hear this conversation. Here we go with Ryder. Hi, Ryder. How are you? Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm well. Great to have you on the show, Ryder. As the founder of The Bullet Journal, we're going to get into everything Bullet Journal and your new book, The Bullet Journal Method. But first, I want to give a little bit of perspective and go back in time and talk about what life was like growing up as a kid. So you were diagnosed with ADD. Take us back to this time and explain what life was like. So when you start your education, which we can like barely remember, you know, it's all about like coloring books and naps and just kind of fun time. But eventually the lessons start kicking in. And that's when the grades start kicking in. And from a very early age, it became evident that I was struggling in a way that the others in the class were not. You know, it would be the last in a lot of different things, specifically more academic things, math, that kind of thing. Over time, it became apparent that I needed help in some ways in order to be able to get by at school. And then eventually the doctors came in and the psychologists and all that stuff. And they diagnosed me with ADD, which at the time was not very well understood. And there were not a lot of tools available to those who were afflicted like myself. So I started developing my own tools and like the only real resource that a kid has available. Remember, there's no internet then is pen and paper. That's what you have. Those are your class notebooks. So I started trying to figure out ways how I could organize the way that I thought in different ways, not necessarily ways that people told me because that clearly wasn't doing anything. So I started figuring out little tips and tricks and ways for me to be able to tackle my challenges with both focus, productivity, and general organization. And most of the things I tried didn't work. Once in a while, something would. And then a while later, another thing would work. And over time, I started to collect these tools and techniques. And then fast forward many, many, many years later, that is pretty much what you see as the bullet journal today. And in the early days, what were some of these tools and techniques that were working for you? It's hard to put a finger on it, right? Because something would just work better. It wouldn't like fix it, right? So one thing that I noticed early on is that when I would doodle in class, I could pay attention better because that part of my mind that was grasping was occupied. And that got me into a lot of trouble because obviously if a kid's sitting there drawing, the teacher naturally assumes that you aren't paying attention, which wasn't the case at all. 
it wasn't until one teacher finally realized that that's what was happening. And she told me, it's like, I always know that when you're drawing, you're paying attention, but when you're looking at me, you're not. And all of a sudden, I realized that I had solved a problem for myself, right? And as a child, that's something that doesn't naturally occur to us, at least not to me. You know, when you have a challenge or you have a question, you ask the tall folks, right? You look to the parents or the teachers or the counselors or something for answers. But in this case, they didn't have a lot that would help because they just didn't know how my mind worked. And it's not to say that all of their efforts were completely futile, but it was just, it became very clear to me that if I was going to make progress and overcome these things, that uh, it would be my responsibility to figure out. The drawing was like the first time that I kind of flipped the switch where I realized like, wow, I can actually solve some of my own challenges. Now, again, this is not a cure or something, but it's like things got a lot better after I made that realization. Those drawings started becoming more topical, you know, where they were started off as doodles. All of a sudden I would start taking notes and like paying attention to the letter forms or like start creating templates that would allow me to better organize very specific kinds of content. So my notes in English would not look the same way they did in math, would not look the same way they did in biology and so forth and so on. And in the classes that I struggled in, I would experiment more and more with these kinds of templates until something worked. It didn't necessarily make me a scholar, but it certainly improved my situation substantially over time. And I know you're originally from Austria, but is this where you grew up? Yes, I grew up in Vienna. How old were you when you came over to the US? 18, to study. So you came across to the US, you're 18 years old to study. What did you get into at first? I picked a college that has strengths both in English and in art. Those are the two things that interested me. My father's an author and my mother's an art teacher. So I'm no surprise in that regard. And those were the two things that I really focused on. I liked telling stories both traditional way, but also visually. I guess I started fusing those two more and more together. And that's what eventually led to me becoming a graphic designer. So once you graduate, you get the internship of your dreams after college in New York. Take us to this time and explain what happened. <laughs> yeah. So when I went to college, originally I had this idea of directing music videos, which when I went to college were a thing. But by the time I graduated from college, were not a thing anymore. You know, once streaming music happened and digital downloads happened, for some reason, music videos just kind of disappeared. There was no money in it anymore. So the next best thing that interested me was actually creating title sequences for movies. You know, those like microfilms that happened before and after. They had been popular more in Hitchcock's age, but then they kind of went away and came back again with movies like Seven and Dr. Moreau. And I just really loved the way that a lot of the times they incorporated both typography as well as visuals and video. It's like very mixed media. And there was one company that was kind of spearheading it run by this guy whose work I absolutely admired. And I pulled all the strings that I could and I got an interview with them. So I went down to New York and everything went really well. And they said, okay, you know, like when can you begin your internship? Like, I'm like, well, I'm still in my senior year and it would have to be after the summer. And they're like, yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. You know, just let us know when you're here and you can begin. And that's what I did. I graduated. I spent a summer working just to save up money for New York because it is unbelievably expensive to live there. And I moved everything I owned into this terrible little apartment and I called up to find out when I would begin. And what they said is, has nobody reached out to you? Has nobody talked to you? And I was like, no. And they're like, well, due to September 11th, which happened a year prior, the economy, this and that, and blah, blah, blah we've downsized, your position is no longer available. So all of a sudden, I was in New York without a job in this terrible apartment and had to begin looking for work. Wow, what a scary situation. What happened next? A lot of months of like very, very dark job hunting. Luckily, at that time, the internet had become a little bit more helpful. And there were like job boards. And I basically just cast the widest net I possibly could and went in for any job interview I could find. And I took the first job that was offered because the economy really was terrible. There was just no work. There was no work, especially for like an art student in New York. You know, New York produces countless numbers of those every year. So I ended up working for this publishing company, more or less designing order forms, which, you know, was 
not what I aspired to do, but it paid the rent and I could finally eat properly. And those things were the priority at the time. And once I had an income coming in, I realized very quickly that I had to figure out how to get out of there. And having just gone through the experience of like eight months of unemployment, not to mention a flood that forced me to move out of my apartment, taking away most of the things that I owned, I started taking night classes in web design because it was something that I was more and more interested in. Again, it's like mixed media, both written as well as visual art form combined into this like interactive experience. And that fascinated me. So I learned how to design and code websites. I started doing that for friends and their employers and small restaurants in my neighborhood and bands. And over time, I got to a point where I scraped up just enough work to be able to move over to doing that. And that's kind of where I guess my career started in designing websites, which eventually led to me designing software in general, specifically online software. Well, I want to continue the career journey here in a minute, but I want to touch on the flood. And this was a traumatic experience for you and happened a period of time after you ended up finding out you didn't have the job. So a couple of negative things happening to you within a short period of time. Oh, yeah. But take us back to that time and explain what happened. Were you away from the home? Were you in the home when it started flooding? Share that experience. The first year in New York was rather delightful. So I moved to New York. I have this basement apartment that I actually shared with two friends. They were one floor up and I was in the basement. Literally, it had been, quote unquote, refinished. So it was job hunting constantly. And the way you would do that back then is you actually had a physical portfolio because people wouldn't check your website. Most people didn't have a website. So you had to bring in printouts of all the stuff you had done and getting high quality prints was very expensive and hard to do. You'd have to go to print shops. Luckily, at college, I was able to do this stuff. So I was doing this, and then all of a sudden, winter came. And that was one of like the most intense winters they'd had in like 100 years or something like that, just to give you an idea. This one time, it started snowing so bad that a lot of people couldn't go to work, including myself, which at the time was just looking for jobs because the doors wouldn't open. Like You could not get to the street. There was so much snow, people to be like, excavated essentially so a day or two later when like the sun came out the snow began to melt and i woke up one day to this like strange sound and i opened my eyes and i realized the floor was moving and i couldn't really figure it out until like they focused and i realized the floor wasn't moving was that there was like a foot and a half two feet of water that were just like maybe an inch or two lower than my mattress right the entire floor was flooded and floating by my bed was my portfolio and I was like, oh, no, you know, like a lot of things started clicking really quickly. I'm like, well, at least I have it backed up. And I like focused into the back of the room and saw that my computer, which was standing on the floor because I didn't have any furniture, was submerged underwater and it's like flickering. So, yeah, I pretty much lost everything that I had, including my work that I needed to present in order to get me work. Wow. What a traumatic experience. How did you begin to pull yourself out of it? one foot in front of the other. I mean, the first thing you realize is like, you worry about these kind of things, right? Like, what if I leave my stove on? Or, you know, what happens if there's a flood or I get hurt or something? And you spend so much time worrying about these things. And when they actually do happen, sure, they can be terrible, especially if you have a family or so forth. But the first thing you realize is that you're okay, right? Though I lost most of the things that I owned, you know, I got over it pretty fast. And then you start trying to figure out what do you do now? What matters now? What is important now? And at the time of this flood, I didn't have a job yet. That came, I would say, like a week or two later, luckily. That's the reason why I took it. Because at the time, I was also homeless because I couldn't live there anymore. There were literally mushrooms coming out of the walls as soon as the water went away. And I'm not talking about like light molds, like literally like Smurf village in the place where I was living. The only thing I was able to salvage were some clothes because they were not on the floor, but I had to immediately have them dry clean because everything was, it was all just a mess. And luckily I had a friend who had a couch and I crashed on the couch for a month until I could find another place. But in that month, I was literally going to this job and coming back to this apartment that could not have been larger than maybe 250, 300 square feet. So like the two of us shared this tiny, tiny little apartment and for that, I'll be grateful. But I was okay. And I had work. 
and you just kind of put one foot in front of the other, you know, you make it work. When the worst comes and you're still healthy, like you just figure it out. This part of the story is all going to be really important to us when we get into the bullet journal and when you put up that first video and how things pretty much went viral right away. And to the outsider looking in, it can seem like an instant success, but obviously it's important to see this whole backstory and the grind that led to that point. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be, I think, more than 10 years until the bullet journal happened after that event, something around that time. But when I launched Bullet Journal, you know, I discovered my career, which was essentially web design, you know, and it started for me to kind of like scraping together whatever I could from my incredibly laughable salary at the time, you know, just enough to pay rent, eat, and then go to night school, essentially, where I learned how to code and design. But, you know, going back to when I was younger, I don't know if it's just being stubborn or not, but like you were presented with an option. And that option is essentially you just accept how bad things are, or you figure out a way to move forward. And I just wouldn't accept the fact that I would be last in my class forever. Surely there were things that I could do that would allow me to progress and then be a valuable member of society in some way, shape, or form. Over time, I discovered I had my own strengths that were different from other people, and I focused on developing those. And a lot of those were creative, but I focused on those intensely from a very young age. I would draw a lot. I'd write a lot. Always shooting films, always doing these things because like those are the things I enjoyed and those are the things I realized I could get a lot of value from just personally, right? I would believe in those things. They gave me a sense of purpose where a lot of the other things did not. And then when I started designing and coding things, like that continued that story essentially and I got better. The more I did, the more experience I got, the better the opportunities became. Again, just like one foot in front of the other, always focusing on what my priorities were. And then positions that I was able to land were better, more senior, or more educational. And I would try to be very tactical about how I led my career, always trying to go into like something that was uncomfortable, but would help me learn. And over time, I ended up just being like a full-time art director, designing digital experiences from everything from watch interfaces to like insurance portals. I wasn't really selective about the kind of work that I was doing. What was important to me was to learn how to become better at what it was that I did, the craft, if you will. So this was the craft of the design work? Yes, the design work, but also understanding how people interacted with systems. I was trained as a graphic designer, and in graphic design, you have a static experience. You look at something, and a good piece of graphic design will tell you a story very quickly, but that story stays that way. And the thing that I liked about creating systems is essentially you have to create a narrative that is easy for others to follow. They depend on you to make whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish simple. Like they're all tools and those tools have to be machined, if you will. But in this case, the machining is the design work. It's not just about making it pretty. It's about helping somebody get to the checkout thing or be able to order this or be able to close down that file or upload something. And those seem like very basic interactions, but there's a considerable amount of thought that goes into making that as easy as possible. And I, from an early age, realized that I really liked systems in general, like organizing things and making things make sense because I guess I struggled with it so much as a kid. So the easier I could make something for myself, the better. And then eventually I realized I could get paid for doing that too. So Ryder, I want to get into the bullet journal here in a sec, but I want to tie in between the design work and the bullet journal. And I know there were a number of startups in between there. So can you just explain what you created at that time? Just before I launched bullet journal, I was, I guess what you would call a permalancer. So it's like a freelancer that will work at a company for a year or years at a time. And I like that. I like being part of a team and like fixing very complicated problems or creating new technology. And when you're a freelancer, a lot of times you just kind of bounced around a month here, a month there. But the longer I was able to stay, the more I could see to completion. And I like that a lot until I worked on this startup. This was not one of my own, even though I had created my own in the past. It was a startup and I just didn't really see eye to eye with the leadership there. But I honored my commitment essentially and eventually it was just like a cog in the wheel turning out assets and you know doing what I was supposed to 
and it left me really drained and exhausted. So when that wrapped up, I had another contract that was coming up in a couple of weeks from then. But again, I was just creatively in need, I guess one could say. So I asked myself, what could I make that's entirely my own where, you know, it's like I have all the say that would actually provide value to the online community of creatives who I had learned so much from, you know, like I'm certainly not the best designer, far be it from me being like a actual coder, but everything I had learned came from people who shared what they had learned freely. And these are like the top of their field. And I always was so grateful for that. And I wanted to return the favor. So I'm like, what could I contribute that is uniquely my own? And it took me a while to figure that out. But eventually it dawned on me that I use my notebook in a very unique way. And every place where I had worked, again, in the digital space, there were notebooks everywhere, whether you were a designer or a developer or a project manager, even accountants, they'd be sitting in meetings with their notebooks. And these are people who have access to the most cutting edge technology. In fact, those were the people who were pushing technology forward. And yet for one reason or another, they still relied on their notebook. I'm like, well, that could be something I could help with. So I sat down and basically figured out a way to explain the way that I used my notebook in a way that would be understandable and helpful. And in that process, I stripped away everything except for the things that had proved useful over and over and over again, over decades of usage at that point. And I had to figure out a language, how to describe these different systems, how they worked together, which is really kind of the secret sauce of Bullet Journal. I gave it a name and launched. And as far as I was concerned, that was the end of that, how wrong I was. And this obviously made you realize that you had this in you all along, going back to your childhood and being able to organize your notes in a certain way. Was there any kind of aha moment there where you're like, I've been doing this for my entire life? I guess the aha moment for me was more along the lines of, I created the bullet journal because I felt surely there had to be somebody else out there that would find at least some of this useful. The aha moment came to me when I realized that there were very, very many people out there who had struggled the same way I had, maybe not in an identical way, but in a similar way. And I think a lot of that started happening when they became adults, when they were like in the workforce, like all of a sudden they became overwhelmed and didn't feel focused and didn't know how to get organized and all these things. And I had the same problems. It just started for me significantly earlier. So I'd spent most of my life thinking through these problems and offering solutions that now mapped onto a need that may not have existed before. And that's something that I learned by interacting with the community that then very quickly grew up around the bullet journal. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Ryder to give a shout out to our brand new show partner, Organifi. We are so excited about this new partnership. This is such an amazing company that is committed to quality superfoods that are amazing for your health and vitality. And they have such a wide range of products that include things like green powder, berry powder, and this delicious turmeric powder that you can mix up with coconut milk or warm water at night, and it's such a delicious drink before bed. Something that's unique about Organifi is that they infuse a lot of adaptogens and superfoods into their products, making them super special. And Jesse and I have been using a lot of their products for many years, and we're just so excited to have them on board. And one of their newest products is a plant-based protein. It comes in chocolate and vanilla, and it's packed with pea protein, pumpkin seeds, coconut, and it's sweetened with monk fruit. And it's super delicious. And this is a company that is just so committed to education and awareness, and they're all about helping the health of so many different people. We're excited to be working with them, and we're also excited to have their founder, Drew Cannoli, on our show next week. You guys are in for a treat by getting some of these amazing products into your kitchen, into your life, and into your body. So go ahead and check out Organifi. Yes, we're so excited about this new partnership, and we're really excited that listeners of our show get 20% off all the Organifi products. To take advantage of your listener discount, just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Organifi, and Organifi is with an I at the end. Go and load up your car with all kinds of amazing Organifi products. You are going to love them. And now a shout out to other show partner, Perfect Keto. 
If you're trying to get your snacking in control this year, you want to get your hands on the perfect keto keto bar. These bars are super delicious. They are made with chocolate, coconut, almond butter. They're super tasty and really easy to bring with you on the go. So whether you are someone who's super busy in the morning and you don't have time for breakfast, this is a great way to grab something on the go. It's also such a great snack to have mid-afternoon when you are having a little bit of a sugar craving and you just need something in your body. This is totally going to balance you out and keep your cravings at bay. You can also have it before or after a workout or any time that you just need an energy boost. So if you haven't tried the perfect keto keto bars, grab a box of them today. I know you're going to love them. Jesse and I can't stop eating them. We're loving ours. And actually, I went to grab one this morning to have as part of my breakfast and noticed our box is empty. So we need to order more ourselves. They are delicious. As a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Perfect Keto purchase. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. These products ship worldwide. You get free shipping if you live in the US. Go and load up on Perfect Keto bars today. I know they're going to be part of your daily routine. And now back to our chat with Ryder. And was there any intimidation at all when this started, thinking that this is such a digital time and people are so into apps, and you yourself being immersed in that world and then making that transition? What was that like? I mean, for me, like, again, it was a very small project, so I didn't really overthink it. Like, for me, the whole aim was, like, I'm going to build this website, and those who find it valuable, you know, it's available to them, and those who don't, you know, that's fine also. I never really was worried about that because I knew that having a notebook was very helpful, especially in the digital space. For me, my notebook was where all my ideas started. You know, when you have an idea, it's like a newborn. It it can't stand on its own yet. It doesn't have all the information yet. And for me to help it grow, the best environment was a piece of paper because it was safe. It didn't have any dependencies. I didn't have to figure out where it would snap in or anything. I just like was able to cultivate an idea much quicker because like if the idea didn't work out, fine. You know, it was just like another doodle in my notebook. It just it was the most direct point between a thought and a reality, like writing it down, like all of a sudden the idea became real. I knew that other people felt that way as well. I just didn't realize how many people felt that way or people that didn't even know they felt that way until they've started getting in the habit of doing it. So the intimidation of the digital space creating an analog thing into the digital space was really never a concern. And I'm definitely one of those people. I can relate. I've always been pen to paper. I've tried so many digital apps and it never works out. I always keep coming back to the pen. So let's just talk about this. What can come of it for people who maybe already do practice this, but maybe don't practice it enough, or maybe someone who's thinking about getting out their pen and paper or starting the bullet journal, which we'll talk about in a sec. Take us through just some of the benefits, I guess, of using pen to paper versus going into an app. That is a topic I could discuss at length. I I guess the simplest way of putting it is that I'm not against technology in any way. I think technology is incredible. I mean, it's allowed us to connect with the world around us in miraculous ways. You know, you want to talk to somebody around the world, you can do it instantaneously. It's enabled us in ways that we never really imagined. But again, that's all because it helps us connect with the world around us. And I found that it's not very good at helping us connect with the world within us. And that's really where everything is synthesized, right? All day long, we're online, we're flooded by our apps, our inboxes and everything, and we're drowning in it. I truly believe that we are losing our sense of self-awareness because we don't spend any time thinking about the things that are happening to us unless there is some kind of tragedy or, or horrible circumstance that forces us to stop. As soon as you open up your notebook, you immediately create like this safe environment. By the virtue of its nature, it, it's immediately offline. And what happens there is that you can actually stop and think. Like we live in this world of unlimited information, but we are very limited. Our time and our energy are very limited. And we are giving more and more and more of it away. And I feel like journaling is one way to remedy that. As soon as you sit down, put pen to paper, like you are finally in a space where you can connect with yourself. You can start to clarify what things mean to you and what's happening to you. A chance to kind of catch up with the digital age, if you will, 
You know, so when you re-engage, which we inevitably must, you can do so with more focus and clarity and direction. You know, it's like we live in this age where we almost like worship productivity, which is okay, but productivity can become its own form of distraction as well because we just keep going and going and going and going. And then finally we get to the end of whatever it is that we're working on just to realize that it didn't matter. Right. And so it was an empty goal. It was a goal that we kind of appropriated from our culture. You know, is that house, is the white picket fence, the car, whatever, that vacation really something that matters to you? Or is it something that you believe mattered only because you kept seeing it on Instagram or were told that was interesting to you? And I think that happens often. And we see this with our growing levels of anxiety and depressions. Like people don't know why they're doing what they're doing all seems kind of meaningless. And I think that part of that is because we don't stop to ask ourselves that. And it's not an answer that comes quickly. It requires work and it requires time. And that's what journaling generally as a practice helps with. It helps me to ask those questions, not in an epic existential crisis sort of way, but like, why am I working on this? Why is this a priority? What do I hope to gain here? Am I learning something? At the very least, do I like this? do I not like this? And over time, when you start asking yourself those questions, it's like training your muscles, right? Your reasoning becomes stronger. You make more informed decisions. You are able to regroup at the very least, you know, and you can start seeing if something's not really working out much earlier. That's really what role the bullet journal plays in in my life. It's a way to protect myself. Right. Or I want to take things back to the initial launch of the bullet journal. And just to put this out there for the listener, the journal in the beginning was an idea. It wasn't actually a physical product. Later on, you created a journal that people can purchase and write in. But in the beginning, this was an idea. And I'm just curious, was the first piece of content you put out the YouTube video, the overview video? The first piece of content was the website. And I sent that out to a bunch of people friends, obviously, and I got a mixed reaction, right? Some were like, this is fantastic. And other people were like, there's too much reading, right? You need a way to explain this much faster. And that's what inspired me to make the video. And the video is what really helped it take off because I could just send it to, you know, the blogs that I was reading to help me hack my life for lack of a better and optimize things. And they just watched the video and they're like, oh, okay. I got it. You know, it's four minutes long. So how quickly did things take off with that video? Once the video went out, things started happening pretty quickly. I emailed it out to, I think, a dozen or so different publications, and then one picked it up, and then then another one picked it up. And then all of a sudden, it was like on Fast Company, and then things started happening very quickly. But after I launched the website, not much. It was just until the video came out and pairing the video with a tutorial one helped people get more interested in the other. So Ryder, I want you to explain in general form what the bullet journal is for people. And I know this is something in audio form that can be kind of hard to explain and for the listener to grasp, but we're actually going to put the overview video that the second one you've done has actually been seen over 8 million times now. We're going to put that in the show notes over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. But for the listeners, just to get an overview before we proceed, explain what the bullet journal is. Sure. So. The bullet journal is actually a methodology. Like you said, it's a way of thinking about content. It's a way of thinking about your life, and it provides different ways for you to organize it. So the bullet journal method has two components. It has the system, and then it has the practice. The system is what the video really dives into, and the system can be seen as a Lego set, where essentially you have many different pieces that snap into each other, but every single piece plays a very specific role. So all those pieces in the bullet journal are referred to as collections. And each collection serves to collect related information. And there are four core collections in the bullet journal. One's called the daily log, which essentially is a way for you to write down what's happening throughout the day. And we do that through a process known as rapid logging, where essentially you're distilling your thoughts into very short form sentences and pairing them with one of three different bullets, essentially tasks, events, and notes. And it's a way for you to just like constantly be decluttering your mind throughout the day. So we have the daily log, 
Then we have the monthly log where essentially every month you take some time out and you take a mental inventory of the things that you want to get done that month. What are the priorities for that month? And then on the other side, you have a calendar and the calendar can be used as a standard calendar, but a lot of us use it as a timeline, if you will, where we write down the most important events that had happened on that day, just as a way to give us context when things actually did happen. When did you send that email? When did that person leave? You know, like it helps us be more honest with, you know, when did you start that diet? When did you actually go to the gym? Those kind of things. So we have the daily log, the monthly log, and then we have the future log where you schedule all the things that fall outside the current month. And then the last core collection is known as the index. And the index is essentially a place where you write down the location of your content within the bullet journal so you can find it again much faster. In the bullet journal, we number all our pages and there are very specific ways that we actually title our pages and things like that. And the index serves as a way for us to very quickly find the content later. So that's super short crash course on the system. But then we also have the practice. And the practice helps us get into the habit of checking in with ourselves and also start curating our to-do lists. And we have two ways of doing this. One is the daily reflection where essentially sit down with your notebook at the beginning of the day and maybe five minutes in the morning and five minutes before you go to bed. And you make sure that everything that you're working on actually will add value to your life. And you just ask yourself questions like, does it matter? Is it vital? What would happen if I didn't do this thing? So we're just asking ourselves little questions all the time to make sure that we are very mindful about the things we let into our life. And then we also do this process once a month where essentially every month we set up this monthly log. And then once we've set it up, we look through the previous month and look through all of our different to-do lists. And this is a critical component. A lot of things that you task yourself with won't get done. And the idea is figuring out why it didn't get done. Like, is this thing still important? Does it matter? Again, is it vital? And if it's not, we just cross it off our lists. If it does matter and it is still vital, then we actually migrate or transcribe that to-do item into the next month. That way, we are reminded about what our priorities are. We make sure that everything that we're working on actually is adding value. It doesn't have to really be this existential exercise. The simple act of having to rewrite something forces you to consider whether or not it's worth that tiny bit of effort that it takes to rewrite it. And if it isn't, then chances are it's really not worth your time. And those are some of the basics of the practice, but there are definitely many more. And I think it's important to note that you can create your own bullet journal just by getting a moleskin with either the graphs or the dots. I think you've recommended both. Is there a preference? Well, you can use any notebook that you want. My suggestion, though, is that you buy a notebook that can last because one of the beautiful things about bullet journaling is that every bullet journal is a volume in the library of your life. You start creating this own incredible resource of both your failures and your successes. You can know how you responded to a certain situation effectively or not effectively, and you are able to study your experience in a way that isn't usually available to us. And it's pretty objective. You're just writing down how you feel. And obviously, our feelings aren't necessarily always objective, but you have a record of what was happening, how it affected you, and that kind of thing. I think the last thing I should add is the thing that makes the bullet journal so interesting is, though I just mentioned these four core collections, the idea is that they set the foundation that people are strongly encouraged to build on. So I provide these four collections just as a way for you to get started. But the idea is that over time, you learn what it is that you need and you start designing your own tools, which you can then plug into the system. You know, whether it's a fertility tracker or a meditation tracker or a to-do list or you're working on a project, there is room for all of that in the bullet journal because of the way that is architected. Essentially, one way of looking at it is like the bullet journal is an empty house and it's up to you to decorate it any way that you want and furnish the rooms with the things that add value to your life. I like that. And I got to say, I'm somebody who for the longest time has struggled to find a way to organize my ideas. And I have a number of reminders on my phone and on my computer, a number of notes. 
And basically I use those with other handwritten notes and my calendar on my computer. So kind of like the beginning of your little video that (laughs) you have online on YouTube. Right. So I'm kind of doing one of those right now. And listeners, you'll understand when you watch the video on our website there, but I'm gathering everything together. And just yesterday I went out to Staples, got myself a hardcover moleskin book, and I'm getting into this. And I got to say, in preparing for this interview and preparing my notebook, I'm excited about the bullet journal and I'll let the listeners know over time if it's something I stick with and how it works out for me. But I feel like this is really going to be impactful and and game-changing for me. So thank you. I'm excited too, because, you know, I've always been someone pen to paper right now. I'm currently using the passion planner, which works so well for me, but I'm excited to see Jesse practice something like the bullet journal. And I can see that I'm going to bring in some of the techniques as well into my planner. So really helpful. But something I want to get into is something you mentioned and a big part of this is decluttering your mind. And I think it's so important for people to use a device such as pen and paper. I find for me, especially, it's so helpful to just unload there. So let's just talk about how we can bring that in specifically, like decluttering your mind, whether it's your to-dos or just thoughts that you have. How can we use this? Okay. So multiple different ways, right? The most core way is essentially to write things down throughout the day. So the idea is the bullet journal would just be sitting next to you at your desk. And then as things pop up, you just take them out of your mind and put them on paper. So you don't have to worry about them or wonder where you wrote it down. So in a very basic way, you get into the habit of just constantly capturing your thoughts. That's basically what rabbit logging is designed to do. But then there's also another way of doing it, which is something that's been done for a very, very long time, far predating bullet journal, which is longer form journaling. And there are many different approaches. But the thing is, a lot of people feel like they don't have the time or the energy to do long form journaling because a lot of times that can be very emotionally taxing. And I agree with that. So at least in the bullet journal, one way we do that is essentially throughout the day, you're just writing things down. Even if something like really upsetting happened, you just don't have the time or wherewithal in that moment to like sit down and start journaling about it. But at the same time, it's still irritating you and distracting you because you can't get it out of your mind. So again, we just make a note of it in our bullet journal. And in the process of doing that, we're basically granting ourselves the permission to think about it later. It can't be stressed how much that can help just to give yourself a little bit of distance and a little perspective, especially if you're really angry or sad or upset by something. You're like, you know what? I have other things that are happening right now. I can't just shut down and start writing about it. So you'll just make a note of it in your bullet journal. And then when you get home or when you have some more time, you'll have it there and then you can expand on it. Essentially, you can really start getting to the bottom of an idea or a situation or your own feelings about something. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Ryder to give a shout out to our show partner, Thrive Market. It's the new year, so it's the perfect time to make better habits when it comes to shopping at home for all your goodies. And if you commit to a place like Thrive Market, you know you've got all the best things already curated for you. So whether that means choices available for your personal care, for your home care, or things that you want to have on hand for meals and snacks, Thrive Market's already done the work for you. All you have to do is jump online and start ordering all the things that you want to have on hand. And it allows you to be a better consumer. And we recommend that you stock up on a lot of things at once, and that way you have less packaging. So put a big order together. You're getting everything at 20 to 50% off of regular retail value. In addition, as a listener of our show, you're going to get 25% off of your entire order, plus a 30-day free trial and free shipping. What an incredible offer. We're so excited to be partnered with Thrive Market again in 2019, and we hope you take advantage of this incredible deal. And to take advantage, it's really easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Go and load up your Thrive Cart today and make 2019 your healthiest year yet. And now a shout out from other show partner, Core Chair. If you've been considering making the investment in a Core Chair, I highly recommend it. Of course, Jesse and I have one and we love the product. 
If you're looking to increase your productivity and workflow this year, the core chair is such a great way to do that. It's also a great chair to sit on while you create your bullet journal. And Jesse and I, when we are mapping out our weeks every week, we sit on our core chair, we sit at our desks, and we take the time because we're comfortable. We've got active sitting going on. Our brain is working better. We're thinking better. It's such a great way to map out our week. So take advantage, get yourselves a core chair. You're going to love it. This is an investment not only in a chair, but in your health. And as a listener of our show, you get 15% off your core chair purchase. That's one five, 15%. What an incredible deal. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair. If you buy one of these chairs, you also get a 60-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk involved. And you get free shipping if you live in North America. Get yourself a core chair today and start sitting better. And now back to our chat with Ryder. And I just also want to bring up something else in your book that you talk about is legibility, which I think could be a barrier for people in terms of jotting things down and writing things down during the day. Because we're so used to this digital world, it's so hard to get back to the pen. I noticed that my handwriting changed after years of not writing for so long. So what I found so interesting that you mentioned was how you may have felt that way in the beginning, but you found that writing in caps and really starting to take the time to pay attention to what you're writing helps you not only discern how many words you use, but also brings you back to the focus of actually writing clearly. So maybe just speak to that, because I think there's probably a lot of people listening thinking, gosh, my handwriting is atrocious. There's no way I'd be able to read my own thoughts or my, my planner. So let's just talk about legibility and people maybe retraining themselves to start writing again. Sure. I mean, I think a lot of people who have heard of the bullet journal see these incredibly elaborate, beautiful examples and feel like they need to live up to that, which is not at all the case. The bullet journal is all about content and not presentation. But then there's also the problem of legibility. If you truly can't read your own handwriting, that's just the beginning of your understanding, right? It's not like, oh, I can't read my own handwriting. I'm done. That's one choice you can make, but the other choice is that you start to work on it. And a lot of time, legibility problems come from the fact that we aren't paying attention to what we're writing. We're just kind of jotting it down. You know, We're tossing the information on the page. But when you start to slow down and really think about your words, slow down your hand, the whole thing is about slowing down and pausing. Over time, your handwriting can quickly improve. It takes practice, like everything else, and like... The whole point of the bullet journal is it provides a platform for you to put in this work, right? There's in no way would I claim that it makes things faster. I do think that over time, though, it makes things significantly clearer. So you might be putting in a little bit more time up front because you have to slow down and write and think about what it is that you're going to write. But then in the long term, you'll have the benefit of that thought, you have the benefit of that time. So you won't get to the end of a project or whatever and then realize that it didn't matter or it wasn't worth it. If only you had just like spent a little bit more time thinking about it up front. And I feel like part of that begins with simply practicing your handwriting. What is it that, that you're writing down? Why is it important that you capture it? What about the information that you're receiving is valuable to you? And I feel like, especially in the bullet journal where we really try to keep our notes incredibly short, right? They fit on one line. That's a goal, if you will. How do you distill value? And in the process, you have to slow down to think, and that in turn also can slow down your hand substantially. And when you slow down your hand, your handwriting can increase. And with practicing, your handwriting can increase. It all takes practice, but it's well worth the effort, in my opinion. And you talk about going online and seeing all these beautiful bullet journals. And all somebody has to do is type bullet journal into YouTube and you can see all these intricate, beautiful, colorful bullet journals people are putting together and they're great to look at. But I think an important point, and this is something you emphasize in the book, is that we don't want to be obsessed with perfection. And this goes beyond the bullet journal, but within the bullet journal as well. And you share a story in the book where you're making sweet potato gnocchi for your partner at the time. <laughs> and I'd love for you just to share that story. And then I want to get into perfection and not falling into that trap. Sure. So yeah, as you said, I was cooking dinner for my then partner and um, I got in way over my head. Like I cooked this thing, like at the time I was not a very proficient cook. So I tried to tackle this thing that was actually really technical and complicated and required a lot of finesse I didn't possess. 
things went wrong and I had to start over and over again. And then I finally, by the skin of my teeth, was able to get it out and, and actually serve this dinner. And my partner came home and she was just like completely overwhelmed by the gesture and everything. And we sat down and she was just like going on and on about how, you know, lovely this was and how good that was. And I just like could not in any way enjoy the experience because everything I looked at, I could just see all the problems that were there. Like that was too cold. That wasn't cooked enough. That wasn't anything. And the whole reason I had done this to begin with was just for us to have like a very pleasant evening together to be able to connect. And because I focused on this thing that actually was completely irrelevant, it ruined the experience, you know, not only for her, but also for me, you know, and it, it didn't need to, everything was good. I had achieved everything that I wanted to achieve, but I just didn't have the presence of mind to accept it, right? If I just served that and been like, okay, now we can connect, it would have been a lovely time. But instead, you know, I had to constantly berate myself for how imperfect the whole thing was. What I find, like, we do that to ourselves a lot. We sabotage ourselves because we have this goal of perfection, which over the years I've begun to believe is a very damaging concept and also a very flawed concept, ironically. Yeah, I can certainly agree. And it is a culture. We've created this culture where we strive for perfection in everything that we do. But I think it's important now to kind of change into the conversation of practicing imperfection and embracing that and knowing that that's also just as normal, quote unquote, as perfection. You know, we're, we, we need to live with it and know that it's okay to just be and not have this standard that we keep setting up for ourselves. We are imperfect creatures. We're limited and we're fallible. And like, as they say, nobody's perfect. But what does that mean exactly? If we deconstruct the concept of perfection, nothing lives up to it, right? For example, you may find a painting to be perfect. Like there's nothing about that painting that you would change. And I look at it and I'm like, I don't like it. Right. For me, it's far from perfect. There's like this and this and this, this. All of a sudden, you have to start questioning the concept of perfection in that if something was actually perfect in all things in life, if something was perfect, that which is beyond improvement, it shouldn't be such a subjective thing. Right. It's imperfect if it can be seen as imperfect by different people. So it becomes an unattainable standard by any definition, essentially. Nothing can be perfect. So what happens then? Does that mean we just like give up? Like, because we can't be perfect? No. The problem with perfection, more so than it just being a ridiculous concept, is the fact that we've gotten to a place where like, if you can't be perfect, then you've failed, which I think is a very dangerous idea because it negates everything in between. There's a huge wonderland between failure and perfection, and that's reality. What model do we set for ourselves in that reality? And for me, it's just getting better, bettering your own standard, essentially improving upon where you were. And once my own perspective shifted on that, things opened up in a great way because I knew how well I had done this time. So what can I do next time to just be a little bit better? And that's a lot more realistic and manageable and forgiving. And it sets the standard where it should be, which is on you. I'm never going to be you. So whatever your standard is, can't be my standard. I don't know your experience. I don't know your struggles. I don't know your strengths. I know mine though. And like with being able to set your standards based on your self-awareness is something that's very actionable and something that can be incredibly productive. And I think that's at the end of the day, what we're really trying to aspire to is to contribute more and to be more productive and get more things done. If your goal is unattainable, then you'll always feel like you're not getting anything done, that you're never making enough progress. But if you're just trying to do a little bit better than you did last time, you know, all that worry goes away and you can refocus all that time and energy into just, you know, improving step by step. Yeah, you bring up two really good points. One, that it's very subjective. You know, we all have our own definition of what perfectionism is. And the other thing you said in terms of if it's not perfect, then it's a failure. Like, I love those two key points because I think a lot of people can relate to that. So some great takeaways. 
Something I want to get into now is the community you've created around the Bullet Journal. So this is probably something that's just incredible for you to connect with, for people who have taken on the Bullet Journal to have other people to connect with. So what are the places that community has created with the Bullet Journal? Online, offline? Uh, It seems to be more and more of both, really. The offline ones I've heard about, but the online ones, you know, anywhere there's a social network, there's a Bullet Journal community at this point from Instagram to Pinterest to Facebook to Reddit. There are many different kinds of bullet journal communities as well. So it's not like there's a Facebook bullet journal community. There'll be like a bullet journal community on Facebook for minimalism, for parenting. You know, you name it, there is a subgroup which focuses on tackling specific issues relevant to those lifestyles, to those realities, to those circumstances. And I think that's an absolutely wonderful thing because that's really the idea behind the bullet journal to help you overcome, to tackle challenges in your lived experience. And the fact that these groups have kind of centered around these things, I could have never imagined that it would happen. But now that I see it, I'm like, that's exactly, if I had to make a wish, like, what are people going to do with this? That would be it. Figure out what it is that your challenge is and try to help others overcome that challenge. You know, like, Those groups aren't necessarily there just to like celebrate how pretty their notebooks are. They're sharing tactics with one another. And that's really always just unbelievable to me because a lot of times the tactics they're sharing are to tackle challenges that are incredibly personal. I mean, dealing from end of life care to PTSD to like you name it, right? Here are people like I'm experiencing this thing and the response to it is so amazing. It's like, here's this horrible thing. This really painful thing I'm experiencing, but this is what I did and it helped. Let me show the world, you know, let me publicly show how this may have helped in hopes that somebody else may find benefit from that. And that's, I I can't take credit for that, but I am so grateful that that's where it ended up going. Well, you touched on minimalism there and you've talked about how you're somebody with your bullet journal And again, there's the whole continuum from elaborate to simple. People are using these journals in all different ways, but you're somebody that likes to go simple with your journal. Mm -hmm. So explain to me, why is this? And is this something that applies to different areas of your life? Do you consider yourself a minimalist in general? Yes, very much so. I think my whole life, I've always been looking for ways to downsize. And then once I had the flood, which we talked about at the beginning, that choice was taken away from me. And I didn't mind it that much. I mean, obviously, you know, there were some things that that hurt for sure, but by and large, is like less stuff is actually okay. I like minimalism because it's not about having few things. It's about having more time and energy to focus on the things that really matter. Minimalism is a means to an end, right? So you have like minimalism and then you have intentionality, which is what I believe is underneath minimalism, if you will. And for me, it's by stripping away more and more, I can constantly be more focused on what it is that is meaningful to me. I keep my bullet journal very minimal because I try to spend the least amount of time possible getting organized so that I can spend the most amount of time possible actually pursuing what is meaningful. Organization can become its own form of distraction, and we have to be very careful about that. You know, you can spend all day getting ready for something instead of like, doing it. For me, that means I write down what I need to write down and then I get to work. So I spend the least amount of time with my bullet journal that still has the greatest effect in my life. Well, a big part of the bullet journal is managing our time. And in the book, you talk about something called memento mori. And this has to do with remembering death. So I want to go a bit deeper here and talk about valuing our time by remembering that life isn't infinite and that we're all going to die. Memento mori is, as you said, it just means remember death. It comes from ancient Rome, I believe. And the whole idea isn't to be depressed or scared about death. It's just a way to incentivize you to be very careful about what you're actually doing in the now. I mean, we all know the inevitable will happen someday. And I feel like in the West specifically, we've demonized it, right? We, we try not to think about it. You know, everything that related to death is like Halloween-y and terrifying and evil and bad and sad. And I, I feel like that's a very unhelpful way 
of having a relationship with this knowledge, right? The fact that we're going to die is one of the only truths that we actually know. It is a fact. And in this day and age, facts are rare. And that's a fact that can actually be very helpful to us, right? If we bring that into our everyday, and it's the way that you talk to your parents and the way that you talk to your friends, the way you talk to that colleague that you just cannot stand, things change. Things change quickly because all of a sudden you realize that everybody's got their own thing. Even if you're having a great time with someone, if you just remember that like your friend will die when you're sitting with them, again, this takes practice and for some it's very uncomfortable. But if you remember that they won't be there, that this moment will also die, like all of a sudden you become acutely more present, right? You really try to make the most of it. And that's how I believe we can use the concept of death as a vehicle to help us become significantly more engaged with our lives. And Ryder, how do you personally remember death on a regular basis? Is this something you're putting in your bullet journal and and referencing like on a daily basis, weekly basis? This is something I'm sure a lot of listeners listening right now can resonate with and can leave this conversation inspired by, but how do they go about applying that in day in, day out? One thing is I wear a bracelet and every time I put it on, I remind myself of that in the morning and I remind myself of it when I take it off at night. And every time I see it, I remember it. So it's like a visual cue. And I think you've seen the bracelet probably in the videos, but it's not decorative. It actually serves a very specific purpose. So for me, I have a visual cue, but that can be pretty much anything, you know. And when I'm getting impatient about things, sometimes I'll remind myself when I feel the sensation of impatience. So, you know, I try to take a step back and be like, okay, how important is this? Like, is this life or death important? Probably not. Okay, all of a sudden you, you dial it back down to five. It goes from like a nine to a five. So that's the first thing. It is not life or death important. So, okay, what about this is important? What matters, you know? And all of a sudden you have more of a model that can help you put things in a greater context very quickly. So for me, you know, again, like I apply this to both good and bad things. If I'm going through something really bad, I'll also remind myself like, How much time are you going to spend in this place, right? How well is this emotion serving you, given the ultimate truth here? So for me, memento mori is just a way to kind of level you out a little bit, first of all. It's like, okay, here are the actual stakes. What is this experience in light of that reality? That's a good way to like reduce the amount of stress you're experiencing in some point. But also when you're with somebody or like you're impatient with a parent or a loved one or a partner or something, all of a sudden you're like, wow, this is not going to be around forever. You know, and all of a sudden you're like, okay, I don't know, maybe you're running a chore or an errand with them and you're just kind of like getting bored or fed up with it. Like all of a sudden you could be standing in line and you could just like remember that when you're getting bored and all of a sudden everything becomes more clear and vibrant. It doesn't necessarily transform your life, but it's certainly makes you more appreciative of every moment. And what a great way to wrap up. And before we do that, is there any other final thoughts that you want to leave our listeners with? Sure. If you're interested in Bullet Journal, I would highly recommend going to bulletjournal.com for the very specific reason that there you'll find the most basic representation of the system. And if you're interested in it, a lot of times people will go to like Pinterest and Instagram, or you may have run across it and Those are very elaborate interpretations of something that's far more basic. Like the bullet journal is all about the way it works as opposed to the way that it looks. So if you're interested, I would start there and then, you know, turn it into whatever you want. But I think it'd be very helpful to have a strong foundation as you set out on your own path. And the new book is The Bullet Journal Method. So listeners should definitely get a copy of that. And Ryder, how else can they connect with you after the show? bulletjournal.com and we're at bullet journal pretty much on any social network all right perfect we're going to link everything up over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com and Ryder, we just want to thank you for coming on the show and bringing all this great knowledge thank you so much for having me on the show our pleasure thanks Ryder. hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Ryder. so many great ideas on how to start bullet journaling so if this is something that resonated with you you are probably going to want to get your hands on the book and grab yourself a journal and start doing it today and the beginning of the year is the perfect time to start journaling so get on it and let us know what you think over on instagram be sure to tag ultimate health podcast and Ryder carol carol has two r's and two l's let us know over on instagram what you thought of the episode 
And also, we want to make sure that you get yourself a copy of our free app. We have it both available in Apple and on Android. So if you haven't gotten it yet, it's easy to do. Jesse will tell you how. And this is the best place to get all of our episodes in one place. So if you don't want to have to search through the stores or have to look through websites to find links to our episodes, you can have it right there ready to go on your phone. So for Android users, it's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Android app. And for the Apple users, it's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Apple app. Really easy to remember. Get your app today. And be sure and check out our full show notes over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 274. We're going to have links to everything we discussed. We're going to have the video we talked about where it shows you how to bullet journal. And we're going to have a nice show summary. So be sure and go and check that out. And before we let you guys go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. This week's fun fact about Jace is that he spent New Year's in Dublin. I hope you guys had a blast. Listeners, have an awesome week. We'll talk soon and have an amazing 2019. Take care.